Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I do know, however, why they're so keen on nationalisation. Uh, it's because they believe that it should be possible to run massive... Um, is it infrastructure? Is that the right word? Or utilities? The, the, the kind of things that are intrinsic, the very lifeblood of a nation. So what would you put on that list? You'd probably put, I mean, most obviously, transport, energy, education, probably tougher, a slightly tougher nut to crack, a slightly more disparate um, playing field. But, but you certainly would put energy and, and transport on that list. So the railways and the energy companies. You remember the 80s when they were giving everything away, flogging everything off, don't tell Sid, all of that? Great idea, we become a share-owning democracy. Quite liked that idea. Didn't really feel politically engaged at that point in my life. I was too busy listening to the Smiths and modelling myself on George Michael. The issue, though, of course, was acute in the previous decade, the 1970s, winter of discontent, Margaret Thatcher riding into Downing Street, pretty much on the back of a promise to break... Uh, well, I think the promise was actually to control the unions or to bring the unions back into something resembling um, uh, normality after they'd gone a little bit crazy during the course of that decade. This is the narrative, as I understand it, as someone who did a politics A-level in 1990, right? And a large part of that, of course, was looking back to Towards the rise of Margaret Thatcher, the end of consensus politics. But it was it was all about nationalisation versus privatisation. I wish I was joking when I say y y you know nationalisation is back in the news when you get an elderly Daily Mail columnist writing columns about British Rail sandwiches, but that's actually happened today. It's so hackneyed, isn't it? It's so clichéd, it's so tired. And yet, where is the truth? Do you know? I don't know. 45 years old, never really been part of a meaningful debate about nationalisation and privatisation. Tony Blair pretty much accepted that to uh, start flying that particular flag would have been electoral suicide, not necessarily because of the thoughts of voters, but certainly because of the rhetoric of newspaper barons and, uh, and, and puppet masters. So, John McDonald stood up yesterday, talked about how they would bring £200 billion worth of contracts back in to public control. Schools um, would be among them, hospitals prisons, which is quite an interesting proposal, um, nationalisation plans that business leaders obviously are spooked by. They suggest that they will send investors running for the hills. If you tie, tie that in with comments from the CBI yesterday, head of the CBI suggesting that 40% of their members are already withholding or postponing further investment and expansion due to Brexit uncertainties. Arguably, the last thing you need at the moment is Her Majesty's opposition um, uh, pledging to throw things even more into potential chaos, but I just, I just don't know. Royal Mail, water, energy, rail, all taken back into public ownership in the first years of a Labour government. I don't think, in all the years we've spent together, we've ever had a proper conversation about this, which is quite incredible when you consider that if I'd been doing this job in the 1970s, we probably would have talked of little else. It would have been like a cross between immigration and parking tickets in the heady top two of all-time favourite topics on a radio station like LBC, nationalisation versus privatisation. So, I, I, I'd like you to call me, obviously. It could be a lonely hour if you don't, but I don't necessarily know that we've got a binary debate on our hands here. It does work. The weirdest thing about modern British politics, or, or at least about where modern British politics has been led by the interests of men like Rupert Murdoch and, and Viscount Rothermere, the most interesting thing about it is that we have an idea in Britain, and I certainly subscribe to this school of thought until I got my head out of my backside. We have an idea in Britain that nationalised utilities never, ever work. And then you have that brilliantly pithy line. And the reason why it's brilliantly pithy is... No, I haven't developed a speech impediment overnight. I definitely said pithy. The reason why it's brilliantly pithy is that it's true. You go back to the last government, the coalition government, and they were pretty um, outspoken on the issue, because it's one of the things you thought the Liberal Democrats might bring to the table. They were quite outspoken on the issue of, of government having no role in running utilities. They even, I think, and I'd have to double-check the detail on this, but didn't they, didn't they take something back into public ownership, one of the railway lines that wasn't running very well? They took it back into public ownership, and it started doing well, and as soon as it started making money, ostensibly for the government, given that it had been brought back into public ownership, they sold it back or gave it back into the private sector. There is a philosophical school abroad 
obviously when I say abroad, I'm using it as a figure of speech to mean here. There's a philosophical school out there that says nationalised utilities do not work. But the pithy, brilliant line we have from the first six or seven years of this decade is that actually governments can own and run utilities in this country. It's just that they're usually foreign governments. That list, all of these things we dig out when we're doing things like this together, the list of countries that have investment, that national countries, uh, national countries, governments that have investments in our public services, governments from overseas, like the French government stake in the energy companies that own huge swathes of, of Britain. I think the Dutch government has got sta stakes in some of the um, railway companies that have franchises in Britain. So we do believe in Britain. The British philosophical tradition does accommodate the idea of governments running utilities or at least governments owning companies that run utilities. It's just not the British government. You think I'm making it up? Have a look at who's funding nuclear power stations, who's building nuclear power stations in this country in the coming years. So let's just begin at 11 minutes after 10 with that strange realisation that actually governments right across the world demonstrate daily that they can own companies that run utilities, that run infrastructure. Just briefly set aside the philosophy of the Thatcher years, which was pretty much, no, they can't. The government has no role at all in this. It has to be very rich people running businesses, otherwise uh, they'd be run very badly. And just tell me whether you think there might be a middle ground. That's all. I, I don't think John McDonnell is the messiah by any stretch of the imagination. I, I'd love to change my mind for those of you who tell me that I must about John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn, but I'd, I'd have to meet them. I'd have to interview them to do that. I'm, I'm blessed in this job that I actually get to have a crack at senior politicians before I decide whether or not I like the cut of their jib or not. Today, um, from Labour Party conference, Theo's just been in touch. We've been offered Rebecca Long Bailey at half past 12. Yeah, one million listeners on this programme, pretty much. One of the most uh, influential, if you like, political talk shows on the planet, and we've been offered Rebecca Long Bailey by the Labour Party. We'll be politely declining the invitation. He didn't even give us Tom Watson. I grew up on the same street as Tom Watson. Can't even get him on the show. Unbelievable. But I digress. 0345 973 is the number you need to tell me whether you think Britain could actually successfully see the nationalisation of utilities. Let me tell you what I don't want you to ring me up to tell me. Don't ring me up to tell me how awful British rail sandwiches were in 1976. Don't ring me up to tell me how awful the winter of discontent was when the rubbish was piling up in the streets. Ring me up to tell me what you think the future looks like. Here's the deal, OK, as I understand it. If you are running something huge, at whatever level you are, whether you're an area manager or whether you're the chief executive of the whole shebang, I don't think it is rampant or rapacious capitalism to suggest that you need to be rewarded for excess effort, you know? It, it, you will work harder if there's money in it, you know, whether you're presenting a radio program and you get extra cash according to, I don't know, how many interactions you get on social media or how many listeners you get on the radio, you will push that little bit harder if there's money on the table. You might be built differently from me. You might be a kind of, I don't know, an equable uh, a, a Marxist who genuinely believes that heart surgeons should earn the same as bus drivers and that nobody will work any harder depending on a reward. But I am a human being. I respond to stimuli. And if there is a reward on the table, I might push that little bit harder to get it. It's a little like kids and exam results. Get yourself a bunch of A's, son, I'll give you 50 quid. Pass your A-levels, I'll buy you a car. Does it work? I don't know. Didn't work with me. Didn't learn to drive till I was 32. But it worked with some of my mates, I'm pretty sure of it. One in particular, I'm 99% certain, would not have got the grades he got if his dad hadn't promised to buy him a Mini Metro. Thank God he got that Mini Metro. It changed my life, actually. But anyway, I digress again. If you take that into the public sector, then oddly... Outfits like the Daily Mail start going mad. It's why they get so cross about the BBC paying its staff comparable salaries to what they get in the commercial sector. That's part of what's happened in this country in the last few years, isn't it? The idea that if somebody in the public sector is getting paid a fortune, it's somehow unjust. But if you want to run the British railways, or you want to run a massive slice of the British railways, or you want to run an energy company, why can't you be paid as much 
in the public sector as what you would get in the private sector. And why can't you have a reward system in place, just like they do in the private sector, so that you can actually bring in efficiencies, you can actually bring in advancements, you can actually bring in profits and process that recognises reward creates effort. That's what I want you to tell me today, because at this curious stage in my life, spring, summer, late summer, early autumn of my years, I don't understand why the notion of a government owning and then appointing people to run something like an energy company or a railway or a prison um, is controversial. And again, for the billionth time this year, I'd love you to tell me what happens in other countries as parts of Britain seem to be folding their head under their wings and pretending that the rest of the world doesn't exist, it seems to me that the biggest lessons we can learn come from looking overseas. So if you've got experience of the Danish model or the German model or the French model or the Spanish model or the Norwegian model or the Swedish model or even the North Korean model, give me a call and tell me how it works where you come from. 0345 6060973. I think nationalisation could be the answer. I'm not sure John McDonald's the man to deliver it, but how the hell else are we going to start closing that gap between people who make money out of investing in companies where you do the graft and see none of the profits? It's 1016. Why can't Britain do nationalisation? Um, you tell me. 03456060973 is the number that you need. Simple question, but one that, oddly, I don't think I've ever asked you before. I, I, I just my naive, slightly sort of leftish worldview says... You can put someone in charge of a company. The only difference is that the profits go to the treasury rather than to shareholders, whether it's a, a railway company or an energy company. Why would that not work? Some people have suggested I've already provided the answer by mentioning the Mini Metro in my introduction, British Leyland being something of a poster boy for all that can go wrong in industry when nationalisation um, runs rampant. But, but how come other countries pull it off? Abe is in Truro. I've got some phone lines free. Don't hold back. Give, give me a call now. Abe is in Truro. Abe, what would you like to say? Um, so I don't typically um, believe in the economics of the left, but actually I, I think that nationalisation of the utility companies is a good thing. Is, is, it, is it even left-wing? I mean, because I, I, would other countries describe it as left-wing? To, to say well, that historically it is, isn't it? Historically, it's a left-wing agenda. Br British, Br Br Britain-wise, I guess it is. But but Macmillan didn't privatise stuff. Macmillan didn't want to privatise stuff. It seems to be sort of Thatcherite. Really, I could be wrong about that. One in my pocket. Academics will be in touch to remind me that actually, I think you'll find that Harold Macmillan privatised the Ordnance Survey in 1963. But you, do you see what I mean? It, it's a it's a post 79 left-right divide. It's Reaganomics and Thatcherism, isn't it? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I'm kind of just looking at it in the context of the United Kingdom. Yes, yes. But I think that basically the, 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 the private sector is basically there to exploit people and try and maximise profits. We all know that. So why would you leave the provision of the basics of survival, i.e. electricity, water, gas, to a sector that we all know is there to exploit people? I'm, I'm a Conservative voter, but I, I, I you know... The Conservative Party clearly doesn't agree with nationalisation of the utility boards, but I actually personally think it's a really good thing. What about, I mean, the, the, the £200 billion pounds worth of P PFI contracts is a much more complicated proposal than merely asking whether or not nationalised industries could work. But, but if you take McDonnell at face value, Royal Mail, water, energy, rail companies taken back into public ownership in the first years of a Labour government, you'd, you'd be comfortable with all of those, except possibly Royal Mail, which is existing in a very different universe from when it was founded. I would be very comfortable with it. I'd question whether it's practical to say, oh, yeah, we'll just do it within a year. The, yes. the operations of actually, com you know, converting that to public ownership is huge. And the idea of just saying, oh, you know, it's a very Brexiteer, Cavalier-style attitude just to say that this massive operation, oh, yeah, we'll just do that within a year. We'll do it in an well, afternoon, Liam Fox would say. We could do it over a cup yeah, of tea. We'll yeah, have it done and dusted. Like... We'll have it done and dusted by tea time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I grant yeah. you that. But that's the pleasure of being in opposition, of course, as, as the Brexiteers are slowly very, very slowly realising it. Reality is not the same as, as rhetoric delivered in opposition. Would it, would it influence your vote? You describe yourself traditionally as a Conservative. Could you see yourself being tempted at the ballot box towards, towards John McDonnell's vision of the future, or would that be a bridge too far? A nationalised... Um, <laughs> I mean, it, I, no, it, uh, it's not... A, it, for me, I, I think that the current Labour Party agenda would be horrendous for the country, purely in economic terms. Socially, I have no, no issue with any of their agenda, but economically... Um, I think that you should be able to, you should earn as hard as you work and as far as your talents will allow you to earn. Um, and I don't believe that the Labour Party reflects that. 
and I don't believe in the economics of socialism. But that's that's personally down to me. No, um, and, and and I mean again, I think between the two of us, we probably highlight the the, the increasingly redundant nature of traditional left right designs because I don't really disagree with much of what you've said, uh, and and I think I agree with what you've said about the utilities. We need someone to explain, and you can't use British Leyland as an example of why the government shouldn't renationalise the railways. You could use British Rail, I suppose, but um, the 1970s incorrigible FCAs out of the blocks early this morning reminds us that was a decade of high inflation and unprecedented union power and or industrial action. It's, it's, it's some of my earliest memories actually involve industrial action in the Midlands during the 1970s because my dad was the Midlands correspondent for the Daily Telegraph and Longbridge, the car plant there, um, the, the, the coal strike, um, his patch included Nottinghamshire, South Yorkshire. He'd often be tooling up and down the motorway. Industrial action probably defined my knowledge of the workplace from, from the outside looking in for the first few years of my life. And it was exceptional. And clearly the unions, or I will say this out loud, it seems to me the unions had been allowed or had gone too far. They did wield too much power. You think of that Carry On film set in the in the toilet factory, the ca Carry On at Your Convenience. It was only funny because it contained a kernel of truth. So when you ask someone who was normally in, on, on, on the flushes bit of the production line to go and work on the toilet seat bit of the production line for half an hour because someone was off sick, then Sid James, the shop steward, would call everybody out on strike. And that was only funny, I presume, because it contained a kernel of truth. But just because something really bad happened 40 years ago doesn't mean something really bad bad would happen today if you went down a similar but not identical path. At least I don't think it does. Um, thank you, Abe. Steve's in Ipswich. Steve, what do you think? Well, first of all, I'm going to be a pedant. Wasn't Sid James the manager? I would be very surprised if Sid James wasn't the shop steward. Uh, no, I think he was the manager. Really? No, I'd have right. thought the manager would be either Kenneth Williams or James Robertson Justice or somebody like that. I'd be amazed. Sid James would be in the brown coat. He'd be the shop steward of the union. Uh, you've, got, you've got a team there. Get them to have a look at it. I'm I don't sure need a was, team. But... I'm relying on my own instincts. Carry on. What did you ring <laughs> in to tell me? It wasn't to pick over the cast list of an ancient carry-on film, was it? A good film all the same. <laughs> it is um, a good the film. Thing, the thing that, the, 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 there's a couple of things. First of all, if you're going to have a monolithic, um, a privatised industry, one of the things that will come with that is a monolithic union sitting over the top of it. Why? Why, doesn't that, why, why isn't that what happens in other countries? That I don't know. I've, I've no experience of them, but I've uh, an experience of what I would suspect very much would happen, where, where you would have, um, for example, in the rail industry, you would have one or two unions, which if you had um, all of the currently separated out different companies, you have a dispute in one company in Scotland, that dispute doesn't affect um, a company, a separate company, a different part of the country, because it's, it's ring-fenced to that particular business. If the whole nation... Uh, it was under one operator, one employer, in effect, then uh, a dispute in Scotland would roll potentially across so, the entire country. So, I mean, workers united will never be defeated is, 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 is your idea of hell on earth? No, no, I think the union's got a tremendous, tremendous response. He was the foreman. Uh, Sir James was the foreman. So he was actually, we were both wrong and both right. He was the bridge between the workers and the management. The, the, the boss, as I said, was Kenneth Williams. And the, uh, uh, Kenneth Cope played Vic Spanner, the union representative. So Sid James's job was to try and juggle the interests of the management with the interests of the unions. A bit like what I'm doing today, Steve. Okie dokie. Um, so, uh, you yeah, know, that's, that's, I, mean, I think the unions have got tremendous responsibility. They are essential, providing they're responsibly run and, and, and have, um, that, that ethical position, uh, to, to be constructive rather than destructive. Yes. And I think in the 70s. Where's the pendulum? That. Where's the pendulum? Because in the 70s, most people would agree they became destructive. Where is the pendulum? At what point does union power become potentially dangerous and damaging? Because I, I, I mean, the 1970s was a very different era. The laws yeah, have changed. Much so. Well, you had you had the fascia laws that came in that, in effect, clipped their wings, and then there was uh, a long period of uh, Labour uh, government when a lot of those uh, changes were not rolled back. So I think there, there is a balance to be had, and that's legislatively. But over and above all of that, I think there's an additional problem, which is which is sitting a few years down the road. Can you think of any industry, in, uh, irrespective of whether it's a utility or automation? Not? 
Jazz the puppy. I know. Who's going to be working in 20 years? I had this conversation this morning already once, actually, talking about what jobs are actually going to be left. And, and I mean, yesterday, Uber, the whole conversation about Uber, we could have parked it and just said, well, wait 10 years, there might not be any drivers. Yeah. Everything will be driving. So I don't, but be you can't, yeah, but I mean, I, I, that, that is arguably a reason why you need to start looking after people more than profit, because... How mad does it sound? I always think of Switzerland. It's probably apocryphal, this, but apparently Switzerland, years ago, passed laws designed to keep its hedges up because it looked nice, even though the farmers could make a lot more money out of knocking the hedges down, like they're having huge sways of the British countryside, farming on a more industrial scale. But they decided to spend money on, on conservatism, if you like, on conserving some parts of the rural status quo. I would rather, I think, pay a little bit more for my punnet of strawberries and subsidize someone working on a checkout than, than spend the rest of my life using a self-checkout. But that's not going to butter any parsnips if, if the capitalists are in charge. That's an argument why you need now more nationalization well, where, and more union power to protect human beings from the, from the march of the machines. Absolutely, and that's where the balance needs to come in. But then you're having to do that in a world picture. If you, you're the only country pushing back the tide and everyone else uh, across the world is is sweeping across with um, efficiencies and able to undercut your markets, then, then clearly you've got uh, a problem. You're going to have to rely on your entire consumer base to, to hold the same... Uh, Not, I, I, yeah, I mean, but well, let's just look at water and energy. Railways, nationalised railways elsewhere in the, in the, in the world... I mean, even if they were run by robot, you could still... Passengers still need to pay money. The passengers are never going to be robots, are they? So passengers still no, need to pay the money. And where the money ends up, does it end up in the pockets of private sector shareholders or does it end up in the treasury? Passengers assuming that the passengers are travelling. Oh, you're, you're, you're a miserable can. sod, Steve. I can't be living in oh, your pessimi I can't be living in your pessimistic <laughs> universe. Will there ever be robot radio presenters? Of course not. You well, then, what are you worried about? That. It's half past ten. Where we have a, a curious question, which is, why, actually, any angle you want on this. I've got three phone lines free, so uh, grab one of them quickly and, and come in it from any angle, because why do you think nationalisation in the United Kingdom is such a dirty word? Is it simply down to the... the I mean, I, I hesitate, to be honest with you. Even my fondness for Occam's razor occasionally balks at the fact that Rupert Murdoch so often turns up at the end of the process. But is it simply because Rupert Murdoch's uh, appetite for money and power was contingent upon destroying the print unions in Wapping, who frankly deserved a little bit of roughing up at the time, but by creating a public appetite to destroy all unions or, or, or to undermine all unions, he effectively managed to free himself up to... Um, transfer production of the sun to Wapping and then subsequently to buy the times with a nod from Margaret Thatcher as a, as a mark of gratitude for breaking the unions that allowed her to sell everything off. So what is the biggest injustice of our time if you manage, if you just look away from the stuff that all the rich people want you to get cross about, like immigration and look instead at the fact that you're working harder for less than you can ever remember doing. And who's winning? The people who are investing in whatever business it is you work in. It doesn't matter whether you're an Uber driver or um, or a doctor or a nurse anymore. Uh, somebody is top slicing off, off your graft. You put in an hour's work, they get paid for 20 minutes of it. It's a matter of, of fact, and it's out of control, and it's the single most powerful reason why that gap keeps growing. The trick, of course, is to convince people on the wrong side of the injustice that they should be in favour of the injustice, because either they could be on the right side of it one day, or it's, they know their place. That this is the kind of deferential forelock tugging at the heart of movements like UKIP, which is why they're in love at the moment with Jacob rees -Mogg. Oh, yes, we know our place. Talk about being anti-establishment. What they really mean is they want to genuflect in front of the latter-day aristocracy, and the latter-day aristocracy are the people punting the line that this unjust... No, we don't want more taxes. Look how much the rich pay in taxes. Yeah, you're not rich. Doesn't matter. They pay loads in taxes. Yeah, but they also take out more in profits than they've ever taken out before. Yeah, but down with taxes for rich people. Um, never get my head around that until I understood the power of the forelock tug, the power of deference. It's, it's what Britain is built upon, deference, knowing your place. Knowing your place, thinking that you have betters. You listen to this programme, you don't have betters, all right? You listen to this programme, you are as clever or as qualified as you try to be. You, you are rewarded for your effort and your understanding. You don't have to stand in a line behind the political editor of the Daily Bugle. You listen to this programme, your opinion is more interesting to me than his or hers. But it's a very odd attitude in Britain. We're supposed to know our place. And here is someone from a think tank. Because they know what they're talking about. 
Very, very strange times. So why is nationalisation necessarily bad? I don't know. 03456060973. Daniel's in Mansfield. It's kind of one of the areas I was referring to when I talked about my dad covering the miners' strike. Daniel, what, what did you ring in to tell us? What do you think? Well, I think nationalisation is a good thing, as long as you take out the profit for it and turn them into non-for-profit organisations. Well, Any profit should be going back into the organisation for upgrading the systems. Not all of it. Well, we're... I mean, if it goes into the Treasury, I mean, it goes into the Treasury, you could, some of the money you make from flogging energy, you could then spend on schools. That would be all right, wouldn't yeah, it? But, yeah, you but look at the Australian system. Go on. They sold their power plant to China, expecting and promising the country that they're all going to get cheap electricity and cheap fuel. And what happens was, it comes around, China sold this electricity to other countries because, and the gas, because they're getting more in the other country than they will in Australia. So they own the, they own the energy and, and the borders become irrelevant. They can sell it to the highest bidder. That's basically what's happening. Now the people in Australia are paying through the nose for something that's produced in their country. Well, I mean, it seems a bit of a no-brainer then that we should try and keep ownership or, or, or return ownership of utilities to, to the public sector. And I, I'm not as hard-nosed as you are when it comes to profit. What about paying the top people? Because I, I think in order to really run the business as well as you can run it, you'd have to pay the fellow running the nationalised railway in Britain a salary that's comparable with the privatised railway in America or, or elsewhere yeah. in the world. You're going to have to pay, but you're going to have to get the right person for the job, though, if you're going to do that. Yes, of course you are. Of course you are. You, you can't just appoint George Osborne's best friend to run the National Railway. No, no, just what, no he, do, he doesn't need to appoint his best friend. He's only got seven jobs at the moment. He could easily, he could easily run the railways on Sundays. Well, that's, that's my point with the politicians. It's they helping their friends out in these kind of jobs rather than the qualified people that should be. And they probably would turn them around with the, the well... I'd say with the resources they've got at the moment. Three train operators, Virgin, Northern Rail, TransPennine, received more than a billion pounds in government subsidies. This is what a lot of people don't realise when they are sort of uh, being spoon-fed the anti-union rhetoric of Rupert Murdoch. They get one billion pounds in government subsidies, those three train operators, Virgin, Northern Rail and TransPennine. How much do you think they gave to shareholders in, uh, in dividends? I so said about 800,000. You're very good. Well, you're not even close, mate. It was 100 million. 100 million. Out of 1 billion. And a company like Virgin, which is Sky Aeroplanes and everything, and they're having to subsidise. Yeah. And this is the thing I've never understood. I, I, in fact, I was a bit thick on this. I was quite slow on the uptake. Hang on a minute. If, if you're putting it in the private sector because it'll be more efficient, why are you giving them a subsidy? And they're closing down stations because they say they're not financially viable, but you're still getting a subsidy. Where my mum lives now... I told you this story. It's going back about 10 years. I tried to catch a bus. I was standing at a bus stop for about 20 minutes, thinking one would turn up. And I looked at the timetable. They only run on Thursdays. There's one bus a week from Bewdley to Bridge North on a th flipping Thursday. If you actually relied upon that to get out and about, your life would have been quite severely curtailed. What's the reason given for there being so few? Oh, it's not a very popular route. Dr. Beeching shut all those stations. Fair enough. Make it more viable. Make it more financially efficient. But if you're running it as a private company, how can you walk away with a billion pounds worth of subsidies? Maybe I'm being naive. Maybe Daniel's being naive. Maybe we're all naive. Vera's in Reading. Vera, what would you like to say? Well, I think the difference to other countries... So I'm originally um, from Germany. Oh, um, yes. We don't... So we don't nationalise as such, but we don't give up ownership. So that's, I think, the difference. So, for example, even Volkswagen, car manufacturer, Lower Saxony as a state is one of the key shareholders. They have non-executive directors on the board. So if Germany suddenly... Volkswagen suddenly decided to close one of the key manufacturing sites, well, the state would have something to say about that. But you know, we've already sold it, so we have to nationalise it. You, you, you're right. you're, you're describing... You have to basically share, well, get shares back. Or do something about like how you're going to get the shares back. Yes. Like you said, other, other, other governments are coming into the UK now and purchasing. It's quite okay. incredible, isn't it? And yet, I mean, I, I, right. so much effort is put into t persuading the British people to look in yeah. completely the opposite direction yeah. to where they should be looking while repeatedly yeah. punching themselves in the face. Right. How, how can a foreign government effectively run a railway line in Britain, but the British government couldn't do it? Yes. And the billions in subsidies, why would we not use that money to buy back shares? Because that would involve money making its way to plebs, Vera, instead of making its way to plutocrats. Yeah, but that, you know, for me, that's always like, as a non-UK person living here, 
it's incredible to, to, to see that happening, thinking, but why are you giving away power? Why are you giving away control? Why are you giving away your right to dividends? And what answer do you yeah. come up with in, on that question? Why are you doing it? Because, um, I, I mean, the simplistic one is the one I just said about plutocrats, but is there a more complicated, a more sophisticated one? <laughs> I, I think it's like historically grown. There, there's such a ne negative view on ownership by government yes. that it, sometimes it's either either or. They, they don't look for middle ground. Yes. Yeah, this is what I mean. This is why I, I repeatedly use the word binary. It's you have to be 100% on one side or the other. That's why I say... Yeah that you could have a nationalised industry, but it doesn't mean you wouldn't pay the top man serious money, because you'd have to pay the top woman the kind of cash that she'd get working in the private sector. But no, you do, because actually, exactly, so you don't try to have government run the companies, you have people who are experts in the industry run it, and pay them accordingly, but government is a non-executive director, so some key people from government are part of the board, decisions to move jobs out of Britain, um, could have been blocked. That's so who, I don't, I don't, who hates what they're hearing now? Do you think? Who's listening to you describe fairly logically an efficient and successful proven system and they're screaming at the radio, no, it'll never work. Who, who is that person? I, I can't quite imagine who it is, except the I person who's currently know. taking 100 million quid in subsidies from a, in dividends yeah. from a subsidised industry. Yeah. Maybe, well, the, the other governments who are um, taking stakes in our... Um, yeah. yeah, you get, oh, get your hands off. Get your hands off British Railways, British government. We're, 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 we're French, German and Spanish and Dutch and we've got, we've got we're minting it. We're coining it in. And if, if you want to move jobs out of the UK, well, and we own sh shares and maybe form part of the board, then, um, well, move them into our country. Thank you very much. 10.45 is the time. So it's not pie in the sky. It's not beyond the wit of man. I, I, I'd like to hear a dissenting voice. Please, please just give me a call. But, but bearing in mind, I don't want to insult the other people listening by talking about British Rail Sandwiches or British Leyland. I, I want to talk about the 21st century, which I appreciate leaves huge swathes of the Daily Mail readership some 30 years out of date. But for the context of this conversation about our children's future, which Daily Mail readers have already voted to compromise and damage, what, what would be wrong... Not exactly making you feel welcome, am I? What would be wrong with nationalising? Intelligent answers only. 0345 606973. It's 1046. And it is nationalisation on the agenda. The um, suggestion by John McDonnell yesterday, the Shadow Chancellor, that he would bring back in house. Mail, water, energy, rail, um, the niceties of PFI contracts notwithstanding. I mean, it would cost him, as some people estimate, 200 billion quid. Um, but this demonization of the word nationalization is what intrigues me. Why? Why in Britain in 2017 do entire generations just presume blithely without really understanding, and I'm describing myself here, please don't think I'm insulting anybody else, without really understanding why it's become an article of faith in British politics that nationalized industries don't work. And it's a question that assumes a peculiar resonance when you point out that other governments, foreign governments, own huge swathes of British infrastructure and therefore profit from it, whether it's the Chinese with nuclear power, the Dutch with railways, the French with energy. And someone sent me a list once. It was exhaustive and terrifying. Uh, terrifying in the sense that it's our money. We pay for something and some of it gets sliced off into a foreign treasury. <sighs> It'd be the people who bleat about patriotism when we're talking about Brexit that defend this, won't it? Happy days. Uh, Peter's in Middlewich. Peter, what do you think? Well, James, it's, it's strange. I think I've got in the wrong slot. But nevertheless, um, I'd like to say, you know, that we have to learn from our experience. Earlier on, you were saying that um, you spoke to um, the Labour Party conference and they put somebody forward who was probably okay but but not you know not who we would really want to listen to yes and um and you know you, you made that quite clear and i feel that that's correct i think that's the problem with the government it doesn't listen to businesses it it doesn't realize i mean i'm from a the 70s but this bit this this government does nothing else no but it just it it, it doesn't and Go the on. thing is that I'm from the 70s, and I had three factories at that time, and they were successful. I was selling many, many garments, everything was going good, and then I had a, um, a, a problem, a pain VAT, and the only reason I had a problem with paying VAT was because I'd had um, theft. They closed me down. Yeah. 
Now, that was, that was the equivalent of... Where, where do we stand on nationalisation, Peter, with, with respect? Well, on, right, on nationalisation, I actually feel... I never ever used to feel that, because I always thought, you know, uh, private sector can do a better job. Because yeah, that, that, that's the gospel, isn't it? That's the gospel according to Margaret Thatcher, and it's, it's been pretty much worshipped for 30 years now in this country, for yeah. nearly 40. <laughs> But the thing is that because it's had a term of being in the in the private hands, and everybody's complaining about the loss of service, about the increase in the costs of all the yeah. products that we have to buy, well, perhaps it never worked, and perhaps we have to really start to think. Well, maybe it would be, would be better to try nationalisation again without the shop shop stewards, without you know somebody who is who is really in control of what's going on. Because now we have a global economy. We don't just have uh, an economy which was sort of England. We're part of a, a global world. Uh, yeah, well, the global world is probably the wrong word. Well, we're, pulling, I mean? we're pulling up the drawbridge. <laughs> don't, 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 don't forget that. But you're right. If we were outward looking, then we'd be looking at other governments owning huge swathes of our infrastructure and asking why our government can't do it instead. I go, Peter, thank you. I'm cracking on because I want to squeeze in a few more voices before 11 o'clock. Adam, for example, is in Enfield. Adam, what's going on? Uh, well, I'm good, thanks. Um, first time we've spoken. Carry on. Um, I just want you to point out, I know, you know, I have no real qualms about nationalising stuff as long as it carries on working efficiently. And if it's not working efficiently now, then perhaps we should nationalise it, as yeah. our last caller said. But one thing we do need to take into account is that all of the privatised companies pay dividends. They do. And the shareholders of all those companies are generally large pension. Well, not 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 generally, but but they are certainly a large part of the um, not, of the certainly process. The power. Certainly yes. the power companies are. I, I, I appreciate Virgin might be somewhat different, although they did recently attempt to float. I think they actually did float. So, so private private sector pensions depend upon private sector profits making their way into the into the into the pockets of private sector pensioners. I, and and of course that goes hand in hand. This is probably why they're so desperate to dismantle public sector pensions because my lazy answer to you would be, well, obviously in a nationalised industry. All the people working in those sectors wouldn't need private sector pensions because they'd have their pensions as part of their terms and conditions as firefighters and police officers and, and, and councillors, council workers and similar do today. But that yeah. doesn't butter any parsnips if you've got a private sector pension and you're worried about losing dividends. Well, it's, but, but if you did that, so, so currently the dividends from those companies go into pension funds and they pay our pension. If we nationalise all those industries, who's going to pay for all those people's pensions? Yes. Where does that money come from? Yes. So it's not just the money for buying the company well, that we need to find. We need to find the money... Well, you don't, unfortunately. And this, is, this, is the, this is the cutting edge of capitalism, isn't it? As if you've bought a pension fund in the private sector, it's not final salary, it's not guaranteed, it's not protected, it's not all those things that right-wing newspapers have campaigned against for years and ordinary workers have gone on strike to protect and been castigated by the right-wing newspapers. If you've got a private sector pension and it fails, it goes down. That's just tough luck. That's capitalism. But I don't want to be the bloke who either that brings in that policy or delivers that message. Well, I think there are protections for those pension funds, aren't there? There'd be some, but you remember, yeah. I mean, the, the, the perception of what Gordon Brown did to private sector pensions continues to resonate. 10, 50, and of course creates the atmosphere in which the Conservatives can dismantle public sector pensions. You say, well, I got, I got spanked under Gordon Brown, so why the hell should the teachers get a good pension? And we're back to the circular firing squad that pretty much typifies public debate in Britain today. Thank you, Adam. Gary is in Wiltshire. Gary, what would you like to say? Hi, I'd just like to say that, you know, there's a precedent for taking things into national ownership. We did it with a bank. Um, so why can't we do it with utility companies? Um, from what I see in the media, we're, companies are forbidden from, you know, cutting off supply or charging too much anyway. If we bring it into national ownership, there'd be a bit more regulation around it. Yes, and, and you're talking about, what, RBS or, or Lloyd's after the banking crisis? Absolutely, yeah. You know, usury companies. And it was the East East Coast Railway as well. I'm pretty sure. I haven't misremembered this. The East Coast Railway was in sort of special measures, so it got taken off franchisees, or the franchisees bailed. The government took over, turned it back into profit, and then gave it back to the private sector. Exactly. It, it, I mean, I, I'm with you. I, don't, I probably don't think John McDonald is the guy to... to go ahead, but <laughs> I, for the record, for people just tuning in, I'd love to find out for myself, but they've offered us Rebecca Long-Bailey today. No, no, none of the uh, top three, at the, or even the top four of the Labour Party. 
Yeah, so I don't think he'd necessarily be the guy to deliver this, but I don't see any reason why it couldn't be a success, why we couldn't have this. We have been bitten in the past with it. You know, you think you mentioned with one of your other callers about the, the kind of union-led huh? uh, disputes that we had. So we know how not to do it. It's, yes. Why can't we do it properly? That's it, isn't it? It's just about learning from the past and then moving into the future. It'd be a bit like saying that because, I don't know, because David Cameron wasn't very good, nobody should ever vote Conservative again. Well, that wouldn't, I'm not saying that would be a bad thing. No, I know. I was just trying to keep everybody happy, mate. Give me a break, will you? It's just coming up to 10.59. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. So, is it possible that when you ban mention of British Rail sandwiches um, or uh, anti-diluvian union practices from 1976, you cite the ghost of Red Robbo and various other Arthur Scargrill, various other characters, is, is it possible that when you remove the most simplistic and patronising of right-wing rhetoric from this equation, there is a consensus for nationalisation. The numbers suggest that there is, believe it or not, even among people who routinely, like our first caller from Truro, describe themselves as conservative voters, I can't see the logic anymore in not putting some of these massive infrastructure organisations, what we routinely call the utilities, if you're looking at the monopoly board, put them into public ownership, run them according to all the same rules of private enterprise and the private sector, with the crucial difference being that profits get ploughed back in to the business, to lower fares, to lower energy costs, to lower water costs, electricity, gas, lower costs everywhere. Instead of taking that money, in the case of those three railway lines, £1 billion worth of subsidies, £100 million worth of payouts to shareholders. So the money is literally coming from the Treasury, which is our taxes, and from our tickets, which are among the most expensive in the world, certainly among the most expensive in Europe, and then people who can't run the business at a profit are getting given our money as a subsidy. But, you know, up the workers.